All right. I feel much better. <laughs> um, last night, I was trying to... I was trying to... emphasize how important it is that Jesus is the Son of God. I was trying to explain why it is such an important truth, and I, I am not sure if most of us were able to understand what I was trying to say. I know it was a little disjointed in some ways, but I hope that the points came across, because I want to build on what I was sharing last night today. I want to, I want to continue to try to show why it is such an important truth and why it is linked to salvation itself. You know, I've heard people say, even yesterday somebody said, said it to me. The Bible says that the secret things belong to God, but the things that are revealed belong to us. And the person in saying it was trying to say, whether Jesus is God's son or not is one of those secret things. And it's amazing. You know, I pointed out to the person, listen to what you said. It says the things that are revealed. What does the Bible reveal? It says Jesus is God's only begotten son. That is what the Bible reveals. Why do you think, why do you make it into a secret thing when the Bible expresses it so clearly? So, whatever is clearly revealed is revealed because God wants to make an impression on our minds concerning something that is important to our salvation and our relationship with him. Jesus, being the Son of God, is one of these extraordinary truths. In fact, I would say it's a central truth in the Bible. Properly understood, Sister Wilson. Properly understood, properly appreciated. It is, it is a central truth of the Bible. When you read the New Testament, what does it say is the purpose of the Old Testament? Or I could put it another way. The New Testament is said, Jesus Christ is said to be the fulfillment of the Old Testament. So we would be correct in saying that the entire Old Testament scriptures are focused on Jesus. They are representative, right? They are shadow and type, but they are all focused on Jesus. So you could say Jesus is the center of the entire Bible. Because the whole New Testament is about him. So Jesus is God's message to humanity. And the, 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 the central truth of Jesus Christ is that he is, was, and always will be the Son of God. It is the heart of our salvation. And what we want to understand clearly is why is it so important to our salvation? Why? So, last night we spoke about Jesus being the Son of God. Today I want to Focus on. Yes, Brother Morris. Um, you know, I think I think what you're really laboring is to me. It's not it, you say it is essential to our salvation. As if your salvation is always. Okay. <laughs> it is salvation. It is salvation. Thank you. It, things that you know, right. you know um, we have long so long. Seeking salvation without. Yes. That we think it is appropriate to phrase it this way. Yes. To get it in the center. Yes. It don't show that we have been in Egypt so long and it is very alliance to get out. Yes. And and I suppose I make the statement from the perspective that Islam represents one kind of salvation. Judaism represents another. Every religious group in the world is promoting a brand of what they see as salvation. Some even through reincarnation. And even within Christendom, you have the different denominations, some of them very, very different in the kind of salvation that they promote. So it's from this perspective that I say Jesus is a center of salvation. But as you say, salvation properly understood doesn't exist outside of Christ. He is our salvation. So this morning, my... my presentation is entitled the righteousness of Christ the righteousness of Christ as we move from the truth that Jesus is the son of God where do we go next all over the world Godhead believers have stuck on the theory that Jesus is the son of God but where do we go next 
That's the question. I think all of us here this morning have understood that the, tr the, the truth, as wonderful it is, if we stay with just the theory of it, it becomes something else on which to exercise our debating skills. Nothing more. Unless we understand why is it so important? Why has God emphasized so many times so stridently that Jesus Christ is my begotten Son? It is related to the question of the righteousness of Christ. We all know that humanity needs righteousness. There's not a question in our minds. In fact, if you go to 1 Timothy 6 and verse 11, you'll find where it says, if we could turn there together, 1 Timothy 6 and verse 11. I think if I slow down and we go to the verses, it will be better. 1 Timothy 6, and let's read verse 11 together. I'll read and you follow. It says, But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, and love. Now, I was a little bit uncomfortable last night. I'll tell you the truth. PowerPoint thing I've discovered is not my style. So I, 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 have, I, I used to be a teacher and it's still in my blood. I'm going to write down, scribble on the board as I go along just to focus our attention. Maybe I, need, maybe I need some lessons. Thank you. Maybe I need some lessons in PowerPointing. But at the moment, I realize it's not my thing. It says to follow. Follow after righteousness. Thank God we are here this morning following after righteousness. That's why we are here. I think some of us came to Jamaica specifically because we are interested in the subject of righteousness and want to hear more of what is being said about it. The, the word of God says, the man of God must follow after righteousness. So you have justification to pursue this thing. And in fact, if you read through the Bible, from beginning to end, you will find that it has always been the pursuit of people in Bible times. To follow after righteousness. And all religions generally are built on the premise that following after righteousness is a critical aspect of life. But in Hebrews 12 and verse 14, it tells us why it is so important. It doesn't use the word righteousness there, I don't think. But Hebrews 12 and verse 14, here's what it says. And again, if you don't mind, you can go there with me. I always like when we look at the verse because then it sticks in our mind more. Hebrews, Hebrews 12 and verse 14. Now, it doesn't use the word righteousness here. But it uses a word which I consider to be a, a, a synonym, a, 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 a meaning the same thing. It says, follow peace with all men. And what? And holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. That's an absolute, isn't it? It says if you don't have holiness, you will never see the Lord. Is holiness the same as righteousness? I believe so. I believe it's another way of saying the same thing. I believe that righteousness, holiness, goodness, what else? Godliness. godliness. Perfection, yes. When properly understood, you have perfection in different areas. You have perfection in, in looks. You have perfection in, in the way you cook. So perfection is a relative term, but perfection in terms of perfect in all things. Well, perfect in all things. But you could say God is perfect in wisdom or perfect in knowledge. It doesn't necessarily mean he's perfect in goodness. Because you can know, it's potentially possible to be per, know everything and still not to be perfectly good. I mean in theory. So anyway. But um I think also Love. What do you think about the word love? Is it possible to be truly full of love without being perfectly good no. or holy or righteous? So I think it's a synonym as well. So I want to leave these words here because I want us to consider. Because the Bible uses those words at different times and I want us to understand we're talking about the same thing.
This morning our topic is the righteousness of Christ. But I believe when you talk about righteousness, you're talking about holiness, goodness, godliness, love, perfection. So, bear that in mind. Because Paul says we are to follow holiness and without this nobody shall see the Lord. So, that is our mandate this morning for focusing on righteousness. That's the reason why we have left our business, left to our jobs, some of us. Why we're here, focused this morning because we are following after righteousness, following after holiness because we have understood that without this, no man shall see the Lord. And it's most, more precious than the lunch. It's more precious than the job. It's more precious than the places we live. It's the most precious thing that a human being can ever obtain. So we are here this morning following after holiness. Now, I have an interesting question to ask. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but I'm going to ask a question. Are there degrees of holiness, goodness, godliness, love? I guess I'll put perfection in there too, but like I said, this, this can be relative. Are there degrees? Can you be a little bit righteous or a little bit holy? Are a little bit good? No. Now I want you to think before you answer so that you're sure of what you're saying. But it, it's interesting that the thought came to me while I was preparing this and I'd never thought of it before. Are there degrees? Is there 50% righteous? 25% righteous? Are we all in here at different levels of righteousness? Are some of us at 10%? Some of us at 80%? Is that the way righteousness is? Now, it's like your answer is very, very interesting because while you might, your answer tells. Is it ours or his? Well, I'm just talking about righteousness. We're not talking yet about whose. Self-righteousness? Can't, can't be. Can't be. That's right. Because if you are 10% righteous, you are 90% wicked. Uh-huh. You are not righteous. All right, thank you. Christ is not on different levels. Yes. He's hundred percent in everything. And when he comes into us, we're hundred percent. So you're saying righteousness is either a hundred percent or zero. Yes. There, there are no in between stages. Right. Now this is the Lord pertains to one person. They? Everything on there pertains to one person. All right. Now I wanted to discuss righteousness as a as a philosoph as a philosophical thing rather than as a person because I want us to think about it outside of Christ just as a theoretical thing to get the concept but you are perfectly right and I agree a hundred percent even even if you don't think of Christ as my righteousness and you think of what righteousness truly is it's an impossible thing to perceive of righteousness that is not a hundred percent why and I'm going to ask you to look at why go with me to Matthew 19 and let's read why righteousness has to be a hundred percent or zero Nineteen. All right, I think we're about verse um, verse nineteen, is it? Verse seventeen. Let's start from verse sixteen. Verses 16 and 17, it says, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing? Notice what he was asking. Could he use another word? What righteous thing shall I do? What, what holy thing shall I do? What godly thing shall I do? That I may inherit eternal life. If these words are synonyms, you could, you could drop in any of those other words. What good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one. That is God. Now does he mean that only God is 100% good? Or does he mean that only God is good? Period. Is, 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 is it really true that it's good, better, best? Never let it rest. Till you make your good better 
and your better best. So is your question is, uh, in this particular statement, is he saying that only God, God is, is one That's right. Is that what he means, or does he mean only God is good, period? Does he mean that there is not even one percent goodness outside of God? Is that what he means? If you accept what he's saying, I believe this is what it means. There is not any such thing as good, better, best. There's no Christian who is better than the other. There's no person who is better than the other. It's either, it's only one person in the universe who is good in the true sense of good. And outside of him, there's not one percent of goodness. Now this is one of the great pillars of righteousness. The reason for the confused ideas concerning righteousness by faith is that this truth is not understood. There are millions of Christians who believe people are a little bit good even without God. There are some who believe people are born outside of God and are still good. They don't accept this truth that Jesus teaches so unequivocally. And yet this truth is a foundation of righteousness. If you don't accept it, if you don't understand it, then there is no way that you're going to be able to understand what righteousness by faith really is. In the Christian economy, in the Christian faith, there's no such thing as good, better, best. So when you are righteous... In Christianity, it's a hundred percent righteousness or zero. I'm not saying you cannot develop in faith. I'm not saying you cannot develop in understanding. But where righteousness is concerned, where goodness is concerned, you either have it or you don't. You're not in a gray area where you're part way there. Yes, Brother Ma. Is there a possibility that uh, you could be an atheist and do good things for people? You could do things which produce a result which has a good effect. Your action is not good. A stone can fall on your house and, and, and kill you. Does it mean that the stone was doing good or doing evil? There's no morality in what the stone did. The effect is either positive or negative, but there's no morality in it. A, 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 a squirrel might be digging a hole to put its nuts and it plants a tree that turns out to be a blessing to you and the entire community. This community. The squirrel did not do good. He was just trying to put away something for the winter, but the effect of it is good. So, um, where there, there are actions that evil people do which have good consequences, but the action itself is not good because everything depends on the motive and the reason. So, what we conclude from this? What we conclude from this that righteousness, and I should write this down. Righteousness Let me write down the two words and I'll ask you to I'll ask you which of these would you say is correct? Is righteousness a quantity or a quality? That's the conclusion we have to come to based on what we have looked at, right? It's not a quantity. There are not degrees or varying amounts of righteousness. It's a quality. And this quality is always 100% because it pertains to who? God alone. Only God is good. That quality of goodness belongs exclusively to God. The foundation of all righteousness is that understanding. Now, the reason why there is such confusion, even among our brethren, why there is this fracturing in the Godhead movement. I will say for anybody who is listening or who will hear this, this state, that the reason is because there are people who believe that righteousness is a quantity. They believe that you get better by degrees. They believe that you develop in righteousness, you get better and better and better, and that our, our, our search in life is a search to behave better. The, and this is because of their definition of, of, of righteousness. So it's, it's, it's important that we understand it's a, it's a quality, it's not a quantity. It's something that pertains to God alone. It's either 100% or it is none at all. 
Now, what is the true nature of righteousness? We just said it. Righteousness is a quality. It's not a quantity. But let's examine it a little bit more. In Psalm 119, verse 142, most of us know the verse. We probably don't need to go there. It says, Thy righteousness is an... Who knows it? Hmm. It says, Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness. It concludes by saying, And thy law is the truth. Yes. The law tells the truth. But your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness. The true nature of righteousness is that it pertains to God alone and it is everlasting. You know, David, uh, I was thinking, you were talking about by degrees. Yes. And these other things that are coming in, like the feast days and the name and the, the, the calendar, the lunar calendar, these people believe that you're becoming yeah, gradually more holy. Things. Yes. You have to do something yes. to, to be righteous. Yes. When he's already done it all. The yes. Do, better standing than that. Yeah. The more they do, the, better their, the, the greater their righteousness. That is absolutely true. And this is why I have said over and over that nobody who understands righteousness by faith can get into feast keeping and these other kinds of things. Right. Righteousness is a gift that dwells inside and out of the inside it produces righteous behavior. Not ritualistic behavior. Righteous behavior. Now, so righteousness is everlasting and, and it pertains only to God. But it also says in Isaiah 64 and verse 6. And here, here is an, a further emphasis on the idea that righteousness is not an accumulative thing. Isaiah 64 and verse 6. We probably know the verse very well. But do you want to go there quickly and let's look at it. Isaiah 64 and verse 6. Many times we know the verses, but it's good when we look at them because things jump out at us that we didn't see before. It says, But we are all, how many? All. Oh. We are all as an unclean thing. And all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf. And our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Now he's speaking about God's chosen people. And if, if it can be said about these chosen people that all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. What about the heathen? Now, when he says all our righteousnesses, what is he talking about? Their quantity. Their behavior. The things that they are doing to try to become better and to try to please God. He's talking about this desire, this effort to become righteous by behavior. This idea that righteousness can be quantitatively accumulated. Step by step. Piece by piece, build on a little righteousness on top of what I have, and I become more and more righteous. How can you become more righteous unless it is by accumulated behavior? You see where that concept leads? The idea that, the idea that righteousness is a quantity leads to the conclusion that I must accumulate it. And furthermore, it leaves me with nothing but to believe that righteousness has to be a collection of activities. A collection of actions. But don't worry, send in Sister Janet. Which is, you know, where that comes from. It is the failure of understanding justification. Yes. Because I don't believe that immediately, if all my sins is cut off by just accepting Christ, or I have to first work my way in Him. You understand? The justifying part of it is a hard thing to understand and accept. Yes. The, 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 the immensity of that grace. Instantly. Yes. That the applied gift is, you don't have to do anything, it's given. And it's complete. It's you complete. know. That's a failure. Because I fail to accept that. Yes. Then you see, it, it has, it's, a, it's a dichotomy. It produces another side. Yes. Which causes a, a, a degree of. And the branches of this tree of error, they keep spreading out more and more. And it's appalling when you look at it and you see today in the 21st century the, 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 the ideas that have infected Christianity as people who are now examining righteousness by faith and beginning to understand it. 
you wonder at some of the things that we have believed and that we see our brethren believing, but it's an accumulation of wrong ideas that have become deep-rooted and then the branches are, 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 are spreading out from the central era and they become more and more pervasive. And it's hard for us to get back to the purity of it. The closer we come to Christ, the more everything is appearing clear and we're seeing, wait, this cannot be, this cannot be. Even though I've always believed it, this cannot be so. And the picture becomes more beautiful. Sister Janet. Of course. He does not want you to even realize that you have to nothing. This is a free gift. Since you mention it, Satan in the beginning said, ultimately, do you know what he said to God? Do you know what, what his behavior said? His behavior said, I can be good without you. Do you think he intended to be evil? You think he said, oh, I'm going to be Satan, I'm going to be the wickedest person in the universe. All he thought was, I can manage without you. Whatever action he took, whatever rebellion he caused in heaven, it was based on this idea, I can manage without you. If you manage without God, how are you going to be good? You have to produce that goodness. You have to find it inside of yourself. So his whole philosophy, his entire kingdom is based on this. I don't need God to be good. And you can see, as you said, it began there. He put it to Adam and Eve. If you eat this fruit, if you disobey God, if you put God out of your life, you can become like God. You all, all you need to do is know good and evil and you're okay. You can study the, the Bible and all the religious books and all the philosophies and all the moralities and know good and evil to the nth degree. It does not make you good. Because righteousness does not come by theoretical knowledge. It does not come by applying behavior it is a gift that belongs to only one person in the universe so all our righteousnesses all our behavior and our attempts to be accepted on the basis of what we do are as filter rods are as dirty cloth that is why you'll hear some of our brethren insist that righteousness is right doing have you ever heard that? Mm -hmm. And it is based on a statement that Ellen White made. And I accept that the statement is there. But I'll tell you something. Sometimes we hear something and we take a hold of the wrong side of what is said. Righteousness is manifested in right doing. Righteousness is not right doing. I don't speak patwa to be a Jamaican. I speak patwa because I'm a Jamaican. If Ken starts chatting patwa, he might soon do it because I hear him pushing a few words now and then. It's not going to make him a Jamaican because he talks patwa. If you do good deeds, it's not going to make you righteous. Righteousness is a quality that does not come from doing good. So when you say righteousness is right doing, you have utterly confused the truth and you have set people on a path to try to become God by their behavior. If God alone is good and you try to become good by your behavior, what are you trying to do? You are trying to behave your way into divinity. When you put it that way, it sounds so ridiculous, but it is absolutely exactly what happens when you try to become good by behavior. You know, I was reading from this little book by um, a very famous guy, very famous in Adventist circles. His name was Robert J. Whelan. Yeah, man. Maurice is nodding his head because he's into righteousness by a long time, like myself. And probably those of us who are old time, we understand that this guy is the man who wrote um, 1888 Reexamined. He reawakened interest in 1888 in the Adventist Church. He started back in the 1950s. A lot of movements have arisen out of what he has, he has written. And he has written, he, he was in charge of a group called the 1888 Message Committee. He's dead now. Died not too long ago, but these brethren have a problem. What we have been talking about here, they have gotten a hold of the wrong side of it. They're among the people who believe that righteousness is right doing. And I was looking through this book and, and several other things that have been written. I found some concepts that make me cringe. I want to read something that he says here. It's on page 10 of his book here. I want you to listen carefully. 
He says we must distinguish between Christ's nature of equipment. He's talking about Christ's ability in his nature. And what he did with the equipment. Namely, his performance. Our performance is sin. His performance was perfectly sinless. Now let me give you the background to what he's saying. He's saying that Jesus, when you read his book, he's one of those people who say that Jesus was exactly like you and me. Plus nothing, minus nothing. Absolutely nothing at all. I touched on it last night. Dennis, he was exactly like you, according to this brother. Not just this brother, there are several others who are prominent in the independent movement who take this position. I was there, I had that belief, and some of us had that belief at one time too. But the, the, the question that, that urged itself upon the understanding of reasonable, logical thinking people is, why did he behave differently? You have heard the saying, there is always a reason. They say he was exactly like me, the same sinful nature. Some of them go so far to say he had the same carnal nature. Yet he's the only man who ever lived who never sinned. And they say there was not an iota of difference. Come on, give me a break. But this brother here says, Jesus' behavior, we must distinguish between his nature of equipment. What he's talking about is his fallen nature. He had the same equipment like we have. Fallen nature, right? That's what he says. And what he did with his equipment. Now he's saying he took this fallen nature and he lived a flawless life. We agree with this, right? But he says our, he says our performance is sin. His performance was perfectly sinless. The glory of the message of Christ's righteousness is that this amazing performance was with our equipment, even our fallen nature. Now, if you read carefully what he's saying, is that the glory of Christ's righteousness is that Jesus, is that human nature, is able to overcome sin just the way it is. That's what he sees as the glory of righteousness by faith. Human nature just the way it is. Fallen nature is able to live that flawless performance just the way we are. Now, I'm saying this because I've read the rest of the book and I know his, what, he's, what he's coming with. He says, the reason why Jesus never sinned, he says, we must not forget the, 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 the kind of training his mother gave him. And he actually uses the word, his virgin mother. Right? It's, it's trending terribly close in a certain direction. He's giving credit to Jesus living without sin, to Jesus' mother. But you, got to, you have to say, Brother Morris, God, why didn't you give me a mother like that? Right? With a mother like that, I could have been Jesus. He, goes, he, he credits it to the mother of Jesus and to Jesus' faith. And he says, you might ask, how did Jesus as a baby exercise faith? Because, of course, he didn't sin as a baby. And he said, you might say a baby cannot have faith. But then he says, but John the Baptist jumped in his mother's womb. He's saying that John the Baptist jumped in his mother's womb because he had faith. He exercised faith in his mother's womb. When he heard the voice of Jesus' mother, he jumped in his mother's womb. Huh? So I can exercise faith being totally oblivious to consciousness. I had respect for him having heard his reputation. When I read it, and the book is here, I can show you afterwards. When I read it, I was appalled that somebody can try to go to these lengths to justify rubbish. Mm. It's based, he, he sees the glory of the message of Christ's righteousness as a glorification of what humanity is able to do. That is not the message of righteousness that the Bible presents. Listen to what he says furthermore. Thus, Christ is that holy thing. Last night we read the verse, right? Luke 1 and verse 35. 
The angel said to Mary, that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. He says, that holy thing. The angel was glory, glorying in Christ's performance, not his equipment. What is he saying? He says, for he was to be born of thee, made of a woman, made under the law. He says, the angel was speaking of what Jesus would do, not what he was. You didn't hear what I said. When the angel says, that holy thing which shall be born of thee, he says, the angel was foretelling or foreseeing what Jesus would do. He was not holy when he was born. He was holy after he started behaving. And the angel foresaw what he would do. That's why the angel called him that holy thing. He says he was glory, glorying in Christ's performance, what he was to do, not his equipment, not what he was. Was Jesus that holy thing when he was born? No. Absolutely. The angel says that holy thing which shall be in thee. Is that what he said? That holy thing which shall be born of thee. The thing that was born was holy. Was born holy. He says his holiness was sublime and glorious for it was perfected in fallen human flesh. It was the result of conflict with temptation. So until he had conflict with temptation, until he became, until he perfected this character, he was not holy. That's what the brother is saying. Now, I'll tell you. We have seen that there's an emphasis on, you know, Morris mentioned imputed righteousness. Now, let me just get this clear. What's the difference between, what does imputed mean as opposed to imparted? Can somebody define imputed for me? Something given. Remember, we are looking at imputed as opposed to. Yes. When something is imputed, it is credited or considered to be yours, but it may not actually be yours. You understand? I, I may impute motives to your behavior. Maurice just got up and he walked outside. I might impute motives. I might say, Maurice is getting fed up of the sermon. I'm putting something and crediting it to Maurice, which may not be so. It's an idea that exists in my mind. But imparted is when something is actually given to a person. It's not just something in a person's mind. It actually belongs to the person. Now, let me ask you. Can a good record be imparted to a person or imputed to a person? A good record. Imparted. A record. You say imputed. Now, I realize that, I realize that my question may be a little ambiguous. I, I, I actually... The point I have in my mind, I have to agree with those say imputed. Because a record is not something that, that, that you, you do or exists in you. It's a statement in a book, isn't it? It's a statement in a book. And, okay, it may be a true statement. But you may look at a statement in a book and you might say, okay, John got 50% on his examination. I'm going to give him 80%. You could say that this 30% was imputed to John. It exists on the book, but it doesn't necessarily exist in John's brain. You see what I'm saying? A record can be imputed to a person, but imparted, when something is imparted, it has to be actually a part of your experience. Now, this is why in the Christian world, there is a great emphasis on imputed righteousness, not imparted righteousness. How much righteousness do you need to see God? How much? Huh? A hundred percent. Is there any other? There's nothing but a hundred percent of righteousness. You need a hundred percent to see God. Now, because people don't believe that you can obtain a hundred percent righteousness as a gift and it becomes yours. If I ask all of you, you hear this question this morning, how much righteousness do you have? You know what all of you tend to do? You know what most people tend to do? They start measuring their behavior. And, and of course, they're very afraid to answer. They're very afraid to say, 
I, I am 100% righteous because you start thinking of your behavior. And so, but in actual fact, if you are righteous at all, it must be 100% righteous. Because if you are righteous at all, it must be God's righteousness. And that righteousness does not come in degrees. But because Christendom emphasizes a righteousness that is not a part of us, but is only a theoretical thing, they emphasize imputed righteousness more than imparted righteousness. That's why a lot of what you hear talks about justification, imputed righteousness, not actual righteousness. And this is why as we are studying into the nature of righteousness and as we are understanding the gift of Christ, we are beginning to focus on the imparted thing. We are beginning to see that what God gives us is not a theoretical thing. It is real. It is the very life of Christ himself. And that's where this doctrine leads us inevitably. All right. Yes. Matters. Yes. Which robs us, even though quoting it, the full belief that it is Christ in you. That is your right, is your righteousness, is the whole yes. glory. Yes, yes, so yes, yes. Do yes. we want to be like the Christ who is exactly like us now? Mm -hmm. I've told my children that you're a baby Christ, you must grow and you're working hard to, to correct the right and wrong. It is actually the acceptance of the gift. And understanding that it is Christ in us that will keep your good behavior. Absolutely, absolutely. So it's believing the truth. I, 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 I found new meaning in Jesus' statement. He says, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. But what is the truth that makes you free? It's not knowing what you must do, it's not knowing what you will do, it's knowing who who you are. That's the truth that makes you free. You are set free by knowing what God has made you. As long as you don't accept what God has made you, you will never be free. You live the old person based on your history, based on your memories. You don't understand or believe the truth of what you are as this new creation. So you remain a slave when you have already been set free. God has provided righteousness. Now, the next point I want to make, and man, I'm going really slow. I'm going to speed up a little bit. But um, I guess I'm trying to make up for the time we wasted. So you might be in for a long session. God's provision of righteousness is given to us in Christ. So first of all, we see that God's righteousness is an everlasting righteousness. And it, is not, it does not come in degrees. It's 100%. And we have seen the nature of this righteousness, that it's not a quantity, it's a quality. Now what we, we go next to is that this righteousness is given to us exclusively in one person. Because we started by saying that Jesus is the heart of God's plan for the human race. So if righteousness is our great need, and we see what this righteousness is, obviously if Jesus is the answer, it has to be somehow encapsulated in Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21, God says, through the Apostle Paul, he says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who what? Who knew no sin that we might be what? That we might be made the righteousness of who? Don't miss that, brothers and sisters. We might be made the righteousness of God. How dear any Christian don't play the righteousness that he possesses. How dare anybody say I'm a Christian, but I'm not perfectly righteous. You deny the very scriptures. The Bible says, in him we are made the righteousness. It doesn't even say of Christ. In him we are made the righteousness of God himself. And it has to be, because is there any other righteousness? God alone is good. There is no other righteousness. So if we are righteousness at all, if we are righteous at all, it has to be the righteousness of God. 
And the Bible says we obtain this in Him. In Romans 3, let's read verses 21 and 22 where it says basically the same thing. Romans 3. It says, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, it is revealed, and it is, it is being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of who? Of God, which is by faith of Jesus, of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Notice it's not just unto us, it's not just imputed, but what? It's upon, it's not only unto. It's not only imputed, but it's imparted. It's, it's unto all and upon all that believe. And again it says, it is the righteousness of God. And why does it say the righteousness of God without the law? Yeah, why does it say apart from the law? Huh? Because it has nothing to do with whether you have kept the law or not kept the law. You don't obtain this by a relationship with the law or by a focus on the law. It's irrelevant of your relationship with the law. This righteousness of Christ, this righteous, righteousness of God in Christ is by the faith in Jesus Christ. It's a gift of God based on your faith in Jesus. It doesn't have to do with law observance at all. It doesn't have to do with accumulated behavior. It doesn't have to do with quantity. It's a quality of nature that belongs to God alone and we obtain it by faith. Man, these truths are amazingly wonderful. So, we emphasize the point over and over. I'm going to put another word on the board. So we see that this word, this word, this word is a word that applies to Christ's righteousness. The word is inimitable. Inimitable. A little bit of a tongue twister. Christ's righteousness is inimitable. What does that mean? You can't copy it. You can't copy it. Now, one of the things that happens when we come upon a statement like this is that everybody starts quoting from Ellen White. So I'm going to, I'm going to precede a few people. I'm going to precede a few people. Because when I came upon this thought that the righteousness of Christ is inimitable. I remember that people always say that Ellen White says we are to follow Jesus. Copy, copy the pattern. And it's interesting that when I was looking for some of these statements about copying the pattern. It's interesting what I found. You have seen them. Okay. Alright, I know Kenny's, Kenny's uh, delves into these things. But listen to what it says in, um, from the writings of Ellen White, Signs of the Time, November 28, 1892. Listen. Never can we equal the goodness and the love of Jesus. When? Never. Hmm. But he calls upon every man and woman, youth and child to behold him. And by beholding his perfection of character to become changed into his image. I like to cut that out and frame it and keep it in my heart and have it as an answer to everybody who dares to blaspheme with their rubbish. We can never equal the goodness and the love. Yes, I always knew that must be there somewhere. Because how can the creature behave himself into the life of the creator? How can any of us ever be equal to Jesus' behavior? How? Look at what the Bible says. The Bible says when it speaks about Jesus Christ, the people that dwelt in darkness saw what? A great light. Can that be said of Ken Corklin? Can that ever be said of David Clayton? 
Can it ever be said of, of, of David Clayton, we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. When could that ever be said of Malcolm McCrillis? Not even when he's filled with the Holy Spirit in the latter rain and becomes one of the 144,000. How dare any human being to talk about we can behave exactly and equal that pattern. How presumptuous to believe that the creature can equal the creator. But you see, it happened because people, people insist that Jesus was exactly like us. The word of God says, John 1, John 1 from about 1 to 18 is one of the, the magnificent passages of the, of the Bible. In him was light, and the light was the life of the... The life, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. When can that ever be said of Sister Janet or Lenny? No. If we don't understand who Jesus is and what God did for him in us as a gift, we can become extremely presumptuous. Again, we read from Manuscript Releases, 16 MR, Chapter 28, I see all kind of writing here. MR number 1213. Okay. It says, We can never equal the pattern. Listen to this. We can never equal the pattern because it is... It is infinite goodness... Practice in human nature. I want to know when Ken will ever have infinite goodness to practice. I want to know. Right? Ellen White says we can never equal the pattern. Well, we will have perfect goodness. Because it will be the goodness of Christ in us. But infinite is a different dimension. Infinite means without limit or boundaries or qualification. This is what was in that man. This is what was in that man. This is what was born in that baby. That didn't develop by practice. This is what was born in this man. He was infinite goodness. Yes, there was human nature. He was the God-man. He was humanity and divinity combined for the first time in the history of the universe. It was infinite goodness. He was the Son of God. In human nature, he was the Son of Mary. And this was practiced in this. God put himself in a human body. His Son came into this human body. And the bush, the, 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 the bush, Blaze with the glory of infinity, but it was not consumed. So, Jesus Christ has a righteousness that is inimitable, so don't try to imitate it. So, if you set out to imitate Christ, you are not only presumptuous, but you are doomed for miserable failure. We may obtain his life as a gift. We cannot obtain it by imitation. Imitation Christianity is the imitation of Satan. It might be also the religion, the, the religion of children. But it should not be the way of mature Christians. And why did Jesus possess these things? Just give me the answer. Two words. Three words. Son of God. Son of God. Other, other words. Begotten, he was the begotten Son of God. That is the key, brothers and sisters. Everything I've just said, everything we have just read, that is so wonderful and marvelous and mind-blowing. It only is true because Jesus is the begotten Son of God. You see why? When we take away this truth, that he is the begotten Son of God, the begotten Son of God in his humanity as well as before, we take away that guarantee. If some people, of course, say he was God himself. And if he was God himself, it still, could, it still could maintain the idea that he had this infinite goodness. But it would take away something else, wouldn't it? If he was God himself, he couldn't die, right? If he was God himself, he could never be limited by humanity. He could never be truly a person as we are persons. Because God is always almighty. 
it can never be made limited as we are limited. So, again, the fact that he's the begotten Son of God is a true answer. Now, I'm going to bring out one more point. Maybe say a little bit about it, and then I'm going to stop because. Does anybody know what time we started? Was it about an hour ago? Huh? 57 minutes. All right. I'll take not more than 10 minutes. Maybe not even so much. Now, I'd like to point out to us something. And these are, these are things that I know we, we understand, brothers and sisters. But I'm hoping that as we emphasize them and tabulate them, they become set in our minds. Because sometimes you know things, but they're not organized. I'm trying to do a little bit more than just educating us. I'm trying to get these things tabulated and organized in our minds. Because we need to have them, not only that we can answer objections, but that we can share things with people easily. Now, the righteousness of Christ is twofold. First of all, it was inherent. What does that mean? It was? Yeah, he was born that way. It's inherent. It's inherent. It's a part of his nature. Secondly, the righteousness of Christ is something that was developed and perfected. All right. Now, in point number two, in point number two, we seem to be supporting some of the ideas that we have read. And this is where we concede that there's some truth in what some of these people are saying. However, the point is that they, they say this is the only way in which he was righteous. They deny the first one. But I'd like to show you that the Bible teaches that he first of all was born this way, and secondly, that he developed this way to perfection as a human being. Both things are important. Why? Because when you are born again, when we are born again, a miracle takes place. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Which of these two do you possess at that point? All right. When you are born again, you, you inherit the nature of Christ. Isn't that right? But then you go through a process where you begin to grow. Isn't that right? And you begin to, you begin to go through a process where that, that what you now have is to be tested and tried and purified. And you grow up into Christ. This second process is not possible for us unless Jesus had gone through it. I want to, I want to make a point and... It's something that we're going to be emphasizing and, and, and spending some more time on. So I won't say too much about it at the moment. But what, what I'd like us to remember is that you can possess nothing in the Christian experience unless Jesus first experienced it. Because we are living his life. We are experiencing his victories. We are taking his triumphs. And living them. They already exist in the life of Christ. You understand what I'm saying? If Jesus never was victorious over sin. You cannot overcome sin. You can be born into a righteous life. Because Jesus was born righteous. You can live a righteous life. Because he lived righteously. So we are partakers of his birth. And we are partakers of his life. That's the point I want to make. And I'll show you both things in the Bible. Christ gives us both aspects. One is received instantly. The other is received continually. Alright? Maybe, maybe, maybe that's not precisely true, but I just want you to get the concept in your mind. Every day, as you are living the life of Christ, you must continually be receiving of Him. You see what I'm saying? You don't get... This, this is once in your, in your life. To be born again. It's once in your life as a Christian. You are partaker of the Spirit of Christ. You have become a new creation. How many times can that happen to you? one time you're only born one time in this life or the spiritual life the bible teaches that if you are ever born again and you turn away from that there's no more sacrifice for sin so this is only one time but the continual living as a christian is a continual process that you receive of him every day 
And this is the life that he lived that he's imparting to us on a continual basis. So he was righteous by birth. We went through that last night. And I want to remind us that if, if we think that the mark of divinity, if we think that Jesus was divine because he had almighty power, if that is our concept of divinity, you could easily be a Muslim. That's what they believe too. You and them have the same God. If you believe that it means that he knows all things, you could easily, easily be the, a worshipper of the God of Judaism. That's what they believe. Our God is different because he has a son. And what this means is that in this son, he has given us some things that were not possible for the rest of the... the, 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 the that were not possible through the other religions. Now, what is the essence of the nature of divinity? Is it omnipotent power? The essence? Let me see if I can ask you another question. When you think of... I'm going to call some names. And I want you to tell me what comes to your mind instantly. Lamb. A lamb. Meek. Meek. I didn't say lamb. L-A-M-B. Meek. Sacrifice Jesus. Dove. Wolf. Lion. Conqueror. All right. Okay. Now we have ideas. In our, we have concepts in our minds and we have ideas. And as soon as you hear a name, something comes to your mind. Divinity. Okay. You think of a person. What attribute comes to your mind? Righteousness. Amazing. Well, you are perfectly converted. Most people, when they think of divinity, they think of power. They think of Moses crossing the Red Sea, the sun standing, chilling, of creating the world. That's how they think of divinity. By and large, that's what you think about when you think about God. But what is the attribute of God that he's most proud about? That he believes makes him God above anybody else? What is that attribute? That was demonstrated on the cross. No. That was demonstrated on the cross. No. When God... Love, righteousness, goodness. When Moses says, I beg you, show me your glory, what did God say? I will make all my what? Goodness pass before you. When the Bible says, we have seen the glory of God, where did we see it? 2 Corinthians 4, where? In the face of Jesus Christ. What glory did we see in Jesus Christ? Did we see almighty power? Did we see omniscience? Did we see all those things that people glorify as the attributes of God? No, what God is proud about. God says in Jeremiah chapter 29 verses 23 and 24, He says, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, nor the rich man in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he knoweth and understandeth me that I am the Lord doing what? Exercising what? Loving kindness. I am the Lord exercising loving kindness and, and judgment and mercy for in these things I delight, said the Lord. God says, that's the mark of the true God. That's my mark. That's how I want to be known. I am the God of mercy and love. If you want to find out what is the mark of divinity, this is it. This is what was manifested in Jesus Christ. Infinite goodness. Pure, selfless love. So when we say Jesus was divine, this is what we need to focus on. Jesus Christ came to this earth and what existed in him was pure goodness. That's why he was divine. The power was left behind. The glory was left behind. But he was still divine because he was absolutely good. One of the greatest chapters I've ever read in the writings of Ellen White is Deserve Ages chapter 1. I never valued it when I just became a Christian. I thought it was nice. Man, when I understand righteousness by faith, you should go back and read it. It's a wonderful little chapter. Deserve it is chapter one. If you, don't remember, if, you, if you have not read it, go back and read it. God with us. That's the title of it. And it tells you that the glory seen in the face of Jesus is the glory of self-sacrificing love. That is the glory of God. So divinity is in essence a certain quality, a certain kind of nature. Not power, 
Not even character. It's a life which naturally manifests a certain kind of behavior. That's what divinity is. When your life, when something flows out of you that is naturally loving and selfless, I can say you are a partaker of divinity. When there is selfishness and self-seeking, you can tell that you are not partaking of the divine life. But when a person is a partaker of divinity, it's not because he's able to lift up a stone with one finger or he's able to command and the mountain moves. He's a partaker of divinity because naturally there flows from him selfless love in a pure state. That's the mark of divinity. And that's what, it, that's what true righteousness is. It's a gift that produces the result. Now, is it possible to be born this way? No, not for the first time. No. Now, but it's, it's possible if you are the son of God. Yeah. All right. One person was born like that, and one person was created like that. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Adam was created righteous. Now, the people who say righteous is, righteousness is right doing, they say Adam was not created righteous because he had never done anything good. You see how semantics can confuse people. But because they don't see righteousness as a quality, they see it as a quantity. They say even Adam was not born righteous, not created righteous. But what does the Bible say of everything God created? It was good. And why was it good? What does that mean? You have to conclude if everything was good, it means that God embraced or God, God infused the life of God covered, created in his intelligent creatures God dwelt and in the inanimate creation God's power was overshadowing everything so everything was good so you can be created good and one person was born good and that tells you that goodness is not a quantity if goodness is a quantity something you accumulate it's impossible to be born good Jesus could not have been born good if goodness was an accumulation of behavior. But he was the son of God. His nature was good. Therefore he was good. Good, You are good before you produce good. That's the point. False doctrine says you become good because you do good. The truth says you are good. Therefore you produce good. It's putting things in the right order. When a person is good, it testifies, it certifies that God is dwelling in this person. What was the source of Jesus' goodness? Let me ask the question again. What was the source of Jesus' goodness? He, he was the Son of God. He was good by nature. Now the last verse, he was begotten of God, the only begotten. Now the last verse I want to read is Hebrews 5 verses 8 and 9. And it has to do with the second thing. <clears throat> it says, let me start from verse 8. It says, though he were a son, that's Jesus. Though he were a son, and I'm going to add something, though he were a righteous son, though he were a perfect son, though he was a good son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect. How was he made perfect? By the things he suffered. By the things he suffered. Being made perfect, he became perfect the author of eternal salvation he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him before Jesus became perfect was he the author of eternal salvation not if you can comprehend what you read he became the author the source of salvation because he was made perfect so even though Jesus was born perfect being born perfect was not good enough to save humanity by itself. He had to live perfectly and have this perfection tested. And through that test, that perfection became perfect in a sense. Perfection became perfect. Because even though he was perfect, he was not a perfect savior. 
till he had faced temptation and conquered it. Then he became a perfect savior because Jesus is not coming to save perfect people. He's coming to save people who have been steeped in sin. People who have faced temptation, who have been battered by temptation. So he had to face it before he could save these kind of people. Because like I said, the, 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 the genius of salvation, the beauty and the wonder of salvation is how God accomplishes it. What he does, you know what he did? He created a, a model. He created a model. And inside of this, this model was called Jesus Christ. And inside of it, he put every possible thing that human beings could ever face. Everything that we could possibly ever need or want. He put it in this, in this model. Everything. And when it was done, he said, it is finished. It is perfect. Salvation exists here. And then he says, all you poor, confused, beaten, ruined people. Look, just touch him. And everything that is there. Is available for you. It's done and finished. It's done already. Do you understand why it is true that salvation is done? Just touch him and it is yours. That's the key. That's the heart of salvation. That's the beauty of it. Not you, not each one of us. I'm coming, Maurice. Not we, each one of us, reproducing and replicating and going through that same thing all over and trying to do what we cannot do. It is done for us. Our, our place is to believe and to receive. That's the beauty of this salvation. So when he was made perfect, having perfected humanity, then he became our savior because then he had everything that salvation needed in himself. Before he suffered and was perfected, he didn't have everything that we needed. But now he does. Yes, Maurice. Jesus was, <laughs> Jesus was born righteous. This righteousness that existed in him was the reason why he was able to accumulate righteous behavior. You and I are unable to accumulate righteous behavior because we are not born righteous. We did not have this element of divinity in ourselves. It was divinity... Ellen, how did Ellen White put it? She says, um, in him there was infinite... Infinite what? Goodness. Infinite goodness. That practiced through fallen humanity. Is that how she put it? Infinite goodness practiced through fallen humanity. We practice in fallen humanity, but we, we never possessed infinite goodness. So we cannot accumulate goodness. But Jesus accumulated goodness behavior step by step. He kept the law. He, his was a righteousness equal to the law. So that perfect law was fulfilled in him. He not only was born equal to the law, he lived equal to the law. He was the law. So in him, in him, there was not only inherent righteousness, but an accumulation of righteous behavior that he can impart to us. Yes. Not, not it, so good. No, no, no. It was always 100%. Right. Which, which, would have, which we equate ourselves as Christians that we are not so good and we are trying to do it a little better until we, you understand? So, so for him, it is rather it, it became that through a life of experience. Um, I can't qualify that. Uh, it, is his it, is, it is his daily experience or testing past, his daily test past, not deficient, daily confrontation of the enemy overcome. That means him acquire that. And that's an acquisition. That's how he became on our part. We, we tend to equate that in Christ our lives. Yeah. We mean it is our daily test of being so good, and we will slip and with that being so on our part. Right? Mm -hmm. Is accepting Christ. Yes. We are thus. Christ was a process of conquering sin. Ours is a process of receiving Christ. Mm -hmm. Which is the growth of faith. 
which is a growth of faith. Yes, that's that's where we are. So it's not in any sense equal to him. He did it. We receive of him. It's a different different course. But we are limited by our faith, our lack of it. Sister Denise, you were going to say something. Okay. All right. Yes. And I'm about to finish. All right. Now the word "learn obedience," the, the phrase "learn obedience" is something that can be misleading. Um, where did he learn obedience? He learned obedience in the Garden of Gethsemane. You remember, death was coming on him, separation from his father, and he said, "Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me." What did he want to do? He wanted to get away from it, didn't he? But the father wanted him to do it. Now his his obedience to the father was tested. Now, in that situation, he learned obedience. In other words, his obedience was, was put through the grinder, through the most terrible experience, and his obedience, his, his, his submissiveness to his father, stood the test. In that sense, the Bible says he learned obedience. Now, he's able to, put, to save you when you are also put in that test, because that obedience is given to you as a gift. Through faith in him, you can receive it. When you face the same kind of test, you can have the same result, because it is that obedience working through you so when it says he learned obedience by the things that he suffered you know when we say learn obedience we beat the child and we, we, we are dealing with a rebellious child that's a concept in our mind but his experience of learning rebellion was right there in the garden of learning obedience was in the garden anyway um, if you have ever listened to the sermon entitled the broken curse you can get a deeper insight into how he learned obedience and into how he developed and perfected righteousness. But it all depended on his inherent nature, inborn divinity. And this is what we need to never forget. The great difference in our understanding of righteousness by faith and what we have heard all during the years is that we now understand the place of the divinity of Christ in achieving our salvation. We understand why he had to be divine. We understand that he could never have been exactly like us. And yet it does not lead to anarchy. It does not lead to something blasphemous to say, he lived it, but I can't live it. He did it. And he will do it again in me. That's the beauty of true righteousness by faith. And that's where... God has been directing our minds and I hope we are understanding. One thing I want to come to with all of us and to leave with us as I'm about to sit down is that we can't keep talking about this righteousness and keep leaving it in the realm of theory. The more God brings it to our understanding what, God, what he has done for us through Jesus Christ, the more we believe it, the more our, heart, our hearts ought to be broken and we yield ourselves. We can trust a Savior like this. We can trust Him. If we have done wrong and He says apologize, we can do it. If He says be gentle to your enemies. If He's my life, I don't have a life to live anymore. I don't have a life to live anymore. I can escape from David Clayton. I can escape from David Clayton because my Savior has a complete life to give me that is far better. That has been our failing all our lives, ourselves. Righteousness by faith means, means God has made a way to escape. Not even from sin, I'm not going to say that. Not from our enemies, but from ourselves. That's where our problem really is. And this message provides that answer.